Yeah, so um, we were looking at um, projection and projection software. So projection equipment is, uh, you know, what we saw that LCD projector and very versatile, very useful uh, for both videos and uh, you know, projecting lyrics. Uh, and uh, so what really um, helps us to project the lyrics are, are the projection softwares that we use, right? So that is that basically <clears throat> is something that talks to the equipment. You know, it's like a, it's an interface. It helps um, put those pictures or talk to the you know the equipment and convey these pictures and words in a in a very enhanced way. You know, we we have used something uh, at APC Central. We use something called Pro Presenter Six. And uh, we use Easy Worship uh, for all the other locations. This is also very useful. So, um, Easy Worship, in fact, is developed by a, a church, a ministry, and they made it. Um, in fact, when they introduced it, they gave it free. Um, their basic model was free, and it still is for all the churches. Then you, you know, upgrade it. Um, so. You know, you have other things like uh, proclaim, media shout, etc., and these are used for. Uh, these are also, you know, equally good. Some some of these have um, the Pro Presenter Six, especially, is a very very um, powerful tool because it's not just for uh, not just for our uh, uh, what do you say? You know, just for the basic. Um, lyrics or video that we put but it also you know it goes into multiple screens like it can go into um, the led walls that we use and especially if you're you know splitting it and putting it into two other you know leds and so on so it's it's a very powerful tool you can you can use the video feed Maybe a person is speaking, and then you're taking a video of that person, and it's a big hall. Let's say it's a huge hall, which can seat about maybe five thousand, six thousand people, um, uh, or, or even if it's less. You know, what happens is the person who's sitting at the back of the hall, at the end of the hall, is uh, most likely not able to see the person, see the speaker, right? So, so what happens is when you when you hear and when you don't see for some time, then there is a tendency to disengage. You know, if you're not so keen, if you're not so interested, and there's a tendency to disengage from what is happening, uh, get isolated from what is happening, and not really participate and be part of what's happening. So, um, so you know, it, it, if there is a camera which captures what is on stage, maybe the worship team or the you know the the speaker, the minister. Then you put it on a screen. Then it it helps you to get in you know re-engage again. So that is the you know that is the basic premise. It's not to in any way elevate the worship team. See, we can use it. Our motive can be you know totally different, right? We can use it for bringing focus or elevating the person or the team or you know, you use it for the right reason, which is to help the congregation to engage, right? Because of the distance, because of um, the lack of visual, you you know, you don't want to disengage, right? So, so these are some things which uh, which are challenges which were not there earlier, right? I'm sure that they were, you know, we've been to meetings where there were, you know, uh, crowds of people, and then people still engage because they didn't, they were not so distracted. As we are right now, because of various things, because of you know, videos and you know, short videos and shorter videos, um, you know the, the attention span of people, uh, especially you know whatever age group you can you can you can't normally say you know it's just the younger group. It's it's the older group also, uh, age group also, so distracted. So if there is a visual, it helps. So you know use a, use whatever possible. In order to help people engage, right? So that's so some of these vid, um, software helps us to do that. Um, what are some tools that are available for worship teams? You know, obviously, uh, YouTube is a great, uh, great tool. 
there are a lot of songs, a whole lot of uh, you know instructions um, on how to play the songs. Um, also, we we have a lot of teaching. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, instructional videos, you know, for various um, various aspects of the team, right? Um, right from visuals to to uh, lighting to um, you know, for each instrument list, right? How, let's say if there is a song like, for example, okay, the same God, you know, some song that we've been singing recently, song like same God. There are instructionals for okay, what should the guitar part sound like? Um, what are the chords? What does the keyboard display? What does the drummer play? And so on. So you can actually learn it well and not try to reinvent, reinvent the wheel of try to figure out, okay, maybe it's like this, you know, there's no trial and error, you can actually learn it. Well, you save so much time. And, and so once you've learned it, you can actually focus on, on what is necessary, what is important, which is to worship the Lord. And so you've learned the skill, you've internalized everything. And now you can focus on what is important and not really get, you know, focused on, okay, how do I play this? How do I figure this out? No. Right, and also a lot of resources like we have the Bethel School of Worship, which is a Worship You online this is a worship initiative with Shane and Shane, uh, Lead Worship uh, dot com by uh, you know Paul Belosh, uh, this Hillsong Praise Charts. So we have you know song words, uh, chord sheets. So really, we don't have any excuse, you know, for uh, for kind of. Uh, compromising on skill or there's so much of resources and so uh, we see uh, you know people being highly skilled and so on so the thing is to really bring the focus to to of course uh, expose this for people who need it and um, and i remember you know going on a mission trip and uh, and i remember this typical thing that's that happened there because we went there and uh, um well, um, I said, okay, this is for a youth uh, a youth retreat, and so we said, okay, uh, you know, I can play guitar and I can lead and I can I can sing some of these Hindi songs. So, you know, are there other musicians musicians who are there? So we can we can you know engage them as well. So we had uh, you know other people who could play the guitar and drums and and keys and so on. So um, so they all you know they came and uh, and so they. You know, we we realize that okay, they were not really they are not you know done their homework of listening to the song and learning the songs that I had sent them. So I went prepared with sheets, you know, I with chord sheets and everything, words and everything. So uh, I just preempted this happening. So I gave it to all the musicians, singing singers, everybody, saying, okay, this is what we are singing. Just please follow this. Right? And uh, there also they had difficulty, you know, saying, okay, uh, they were playing their own thing and not really playing. And so it was not s sounding together. Uh, and so, you know, we were able to like, show them, you know, hey guys, you know, this is what you do, you know, play the thing, what's on the sheet, and it'll sound good. And you'll be, you know, you'll be more confident. We can focus on what really is important and so on. So, um, so we were able to do that, you know, that's the end result. So, Really, today we don't have any excuses. You know, there's so much of information, there's so much of instructions, training, and so on. So, if the team would commit, if the team would, um, you know, take some time to explore and and check and and put in that effort, put in the work, really, um, there can be no end to enhancing the skill of learning uh, something, right? Not just Worship, but almost anything, right? You have it, and it doesn't cost much. Most of these things are free, right? So, um, yeah. So, just wanted to share that. Any any questions? Any thoughts here? Anything that you want to share? Any maybe difficulty that you've encountered? Um, anything at all? Uh, 
Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, some, so another thing that we can think of is uh, making the transition, you know, right? Now, we know that certain churches are ready to make that shift and ready to adopt. We, we always have, you know, um, early adopters when it comes to technology, when it comes to, you know, enhancing things and changing things and um, having that vision so that we can always have early adopters. So these are people who want to try out the new things and want to use, and these are the pioneers. So it it goes with the leadership, it goes with the vision. So they, they're not afraid of trying out new things. They want to try out new technology, et cetera, and so that it helps. Um, also, if um, um, there, there also could be you know, people who are waiting and they're not early adopters, they want to see, you know, you want to see other churches, they want to see other ministries um, and to see the effect of it before we they actually use it. And they're all, always the late adopters, you know, uh, who, are, who are very skeptical of technology, you know, who are who even say, okay, this is of the devil, <laughs> right? So they don't want to use it, use any of this new technology and uh, or any instruments or anything. Um, and right till the end, maybe there's something else which has come and then they adopt to this technology right at the end of it. Um, so that is, that is always a reality. Um, but, you know, the thing is to... Um, and we want to help the leader or the leadership uh, understand that transition takes time and uh, transition helps with education uh, educating the people who are involved training it also helps if we are able to give a demo right so all those fears questions everything because um, a lot of resistance to change um, one is, of course, the newness of technology and all that. Is all a, a big one is also the resource. You know, why should we allocate so much resource for this? You know, it's not like the church does not have, but they're just asking. You know, is it a rightful use of resource? Right. So, um, well, we need to you know, check. Is it is it something that we need? Uh, all this that we talked about. Is it something that we need right now? Is it something essential? If it is, you know, go for it and see if if it can be affordable. If uh, something is not affordable, see what is the next best affordable option, right? So we can always do that. There's always there are always options. There are always, you know, uh, sound equipment running to lakhs. There are always equipment which is less than that. But there's a reason why it's priced highly. Uh, because of its quality and effectiveness, and you know, um, uh, uh, and also um, you know, e effectiveness, quality, and also the endurance of it, right? A long-term endurance of it. So there's a reason why it's priced, right? But you find out why. You can you can get good quality things if you do some research and you check with people, the right people, and and we can you know get the right thing. Okay, so um, there is a cost involved. So we need to see: Do we really need it? You know, and will it solve a lot of problems? Right. So and it requires. Um, so you, you know, everybody, everybody is happy you know, when certain some of these problems are solved. I, I remember, you know, when we were having a projector and it was always it was going dimmer by the day, and and we were trying to change the bulb for the projector, it would work for some time. And because it was really an outdated one, but when we changed it and, you know, it was uh, it was a really bright lamp and a powerful projector. And even with sunlight, it would be so sunlight coming in, it'd be very powerful. Then everybody's happy, right? It, did it have a cost? Yeah, it had a cost, but now everybody's happy. Oh, I'm glad we, you know, but initially there is this question, you know, should we, should we not? So it is with all the other stuff but it, it's good to discuss it's good to see and also come to a conclusion like maybe it's not something that we need right now maybe next year we can look at it maybe two years down the line we can look at it right so so that is also something that's also a wise decision right you see that okay right now 
there's no requirement for it or need for it. But when we grow, and when we have, uh, when the resources also grow, yeah, we can, you know, invest in such a thing, right? Um, you know, with all this equipment, one thing we need to understand is the maintenance and repair. Okay, so when you buy a car, when you buy a bike, well, nobody talks about that, right? Uh, this is it. You know, you, if you're thinking of, you know, let's say you're buying one of these um, battery-run bikes for, I don't know how it costs, how much it costs, maybe a lakh or something. Now I think close to a lakh. You buy it. It's so like, wow, wonderful. No noise, nothing. Just charge it and run it. But there is a cost to it, right? Because what is the cost? The running cost, the maintenance of it. So you need to charge it. There is a cost. And what if the charger? gets repaired, there is a cost. How long or how often should the vehicle be serviced? There is a cost. And if the battery runs out, it needs to be repaired. And then suddenly you realize that, hey, it is actually the cost of the vehicle. Right? Or it's 80% to 90% of the cost of the vehicle to re recharge or replace that battery. So it's as good as sometimes buying a new vehicle. So how long does the battery last? right? Um, with all its recharging and so on. So, so these are costs. So similarly, there is the operational cost of servicing, which uh, comes under maintenance, right? So into, it's a gadget after all, end of the day, it's a gadget, it's a, it's a machine, it's prone to failure. There are several reasons. Um, and so it would need some additional things to protect it, right? Suppose you get a mixer, it's worth, suppose, you know, a digital mixer, it might run into lakhs. But then you need to have a good inverter or a stabilizer so that there's no spike in power. You know, there's a high voltage, suddenly goes in, and that's it. Whatever you bought for lakhs is gone in a second because the, the, this power thing went in, and all those, you know, IC chips, they're just blue. And there's no way to replay, or even if you replace it, it's going to be at a very high cost. So, so there's that additional thing of protecting those in, in, instruments that you're buying uh, with, you know, from electrical impulses and similar things. You know, you carry it, you store it. Rats come and chew on some cables, so you need to have some protective cases, uh, some hard case because you're shifting things. You know, all these. Uh, when you store it, you need a storage space and you know the right place to shift. Uh, ease of shifting, you need to have something with wheels and all that. So all that comes with it. Right? So we need to prepare mentally for it, uh, share with the leadership, this is how it's going to be. This is how much it is. Do we still need it? Right? Do we still want it? And, and then take a decision. So repair, maintenance, servicing cost also, storage also has to be discussed. Many times we don't. You know, We just go so excited. Oh, this is good. This is great. Uh, this is what we need. Let's go. You, you know, think about all that daily, monthly. What is it that is required? That also needs to be factored in. Okay. Okay. Here's a question. So, uh, if someone makes a mistake in tune or song while worship is on, how can you deal with that situation? Yeah. Um, so, mistakes. Uh, you know, everyone makes mistakes. Um, hopefully, we can move on after you know after that mistake or maybe you know sometimes mistakes like uh, you sang you sang the wrong line or you started the wrong song right so that happens and then uh, or your my mind just went blank and you didn't sing it and uh, you know and the congregation is also uh, you know kind of confused and that happens all the time so um let's say you know sometimes the mistake you cannot just go on with it because you started uh, you know, let's say for a particular song, you started the either too slow or too fast, or you started on a wrong chord. Right? The worship leader made a mistake of starting it on a wrong chord, and everybody's on a wrong, you know, different chord altogether. So, best thing is to stop, apologize, start. You know, nothing wrong. Uh, you know, it's not like the Lord will say, "Okay, you guys made a mistake. I'm going to the next church." You know, I'm going to leave this church now. No. But the thing is that people are confused, people are disturbed, but you can always bring back the focus. So the thing is to st stop and start. Yeah, there are some things which are minor, which you can just, you know, just go ahead with it. You know, maybe 
uh, you sang something you know different from what everybody was singing and you can always you know change go back or you played something wrong wrong chord can't do it, anything you know just went but you quickly change make sure that the next time you don't play that same thing yeah so um so this this is bound to happen but over a period of time you realize that hey, you can you can minimize those kind of mistakes with better preparation and even if they do happen it happens to the best of people right so um and I, I remember watching a video. This is a very seasoned worship leader, Martin Smith. And then, you know, he uh, goes on and then about to start a song. And it's a very solemn moment, you know, very reverent. And then, moment. And then I think he goes on to the keyboard. For, normally, he plays the guitar. He goes on to the keyboard and and he presses something and it starts one beat. It's like this chank, this chank kind of beat. And the whole thing is, you know, kind of everybody laughs and, but there's nothing else, you know, you can do. So he just says, oops, sorry. And then restarts the whole thing. And so, yeah, it can happen to anyone. But the thing is to learn, minimize, um, adapt to certain things and keep going. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, those are some things, um, hopefully helpful for us. And uh, if we are, you know, in worship ministry and also those who are overseeing the church in general and worship ministry is part of it. And you, you just can't, you know, say, okay, I, I don't want to look into it and you know, someone else will be the expert on it. Yeah, it's good. They'll get into the details of it, but it's good for us to know and not be totally ignorant of how these things um, work, right? Okay. So now let's look at another aspect, uh, which is uh, coming back to the you know the church as a worship worshiping community to develop the church you know as a worshiping community so the thing is that um, see we're looking at how as as a church as a ministry one of the one of the things when we discuss the vision is that yeah the vision is that i personally delight god's heart in unhindered or unrestrained worship Right, and pursue and experience the manifest presence of God. But if you look at the last part of that vision statement, it means it it means developing, establishing every person in in this right in in worship. So, which means um, there's learning, there is equipping, um, there is doing, leading by example, so that everybody. Is you know we facilitate so that everybody encounters God in worship for themselves, and they are established more and more, and and worshiping in spirit and truth becomes the culture of the church, right? So uh, it people are not just waiting to be told what to do; they're not waiting to be instructed, exhorted, whatever. But then uh, you know they enter into worship, right? So several things happen when we worship the Lord. Uh, this is a reiteration of what we, you know, what we would have learned in the first semester, praise and worship. Right? When we worship the Lord together as a congregation, we minister to God. Right? We, um, it's not with any motive of receiving something, though we do receive, we do experience His presence, we do receive breakthroughs, um, but we minister unto the Lord. Right? So that's the focus. Um, we minister to the Lord. We experience the presence of God. Right, and uh, it is the very atmosphere for the release of uh, spiritual gifts or gifts of the spirit and so on. So um, it also brings about a sense of unity within the church. If there are barriers, relational barriers, if there are, you know, there's unnecessary strife or this thing, there is a there is a sense of unity because we are worshiping the same God. We are worshiping the same Lord. And you know, as we do that, you realize that hey, we are all one in Christ. There is a sense of unity, even across denominations. I remember many years ago we had uh, what we call as Unity Sunday, and we had you know kind of different churches come together on one Sunday, and and uh, I think it was on Independence Day or Republic Day. I, I forget, but we had what is called a Unity Sunday, and this is of course pre-COVID, and we did it a couple of times in the city and different churches. Uh, could do that. They could come and we could do it, and we couldn't continue that 
for various reasons. But but what we realized was, you know, irrespective of what denomination or you, know, you might be from, uh, there is a sense of oneness. You realize that hey, I know, you know, there's this AG, there's this, you know, uh, you know, other mainline congregational I mean, congregations and. You know, there's the independent church there, and there's this other denomination there. But then we we all come together. The commonality is Jesus, and we are worshiping the Lord together, right? Together in words and song, and brings a sense of unity. And and so also in the local church, you know, when there is all these sometimes as also you know because of the work of the enemy maybe, and because of the work of our own own flesh, maybe there's strife or division or whatever enmity. It brings about a sense of unity and healing, right? As we worship the Lord together, in the songs that we sing, right? We see in Ephesians five nineteen, uh, we are singing, speaking to each other, and singing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. And so, when we do that, you know, hymns especially are songs which have a lot of theology, you know, has a lot of doctrine. Um, so also the others, right? Spiritual songs, and they have. They have truth. They have teaching. They have instruction. When we when we sing, so that gets reiterated, right? So, so it's important to to really think about what are the kinds of songs that we are sing, singing. You know, are these songs of faith? Are these songs of songs that are rooted in the word, or are these songs which are, you know, kind of diluted and not really the truth, you know. Some, sometimes the the songs can be a and it's a nice song, but doctrinally, theologically, it may may not be sound, right? So, and uh, and sometimes, you know, as a church, we kind of change, tweak uh, the songs a little bit, you know, lyrics a little bit, to just align it. So otherwise, it's a great song, but just a couple of lines or maybe one line there seems a little out of place. You know? So, uh, so. You know, you, you you can do that, but the thing is this: the important thing is that you are actually teaching truth, spiritual truth, reinforcing sp uh, scripture and doctrine and so on in the songs that we sing, right? Because we remember the songs, right? Um, I, I'm sure that you know, if you if you want to remember, recall the words of a song, um, the way you recall is you will try singing it, right? You will try singing that song. Okay, this is how it goes, um, and then. You recall the words of the song, so you remember the tune, you remember the melody, and then you remember the words as well. So it helps, right? Uh, Colossians three sixteen, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Right? Um, Ephesians five talks about being filled with the Spirit. Colossians three talks about the word of God dwelling in us richly, and therefore, you know, we the outflow of that is these songs and hymns and spiritual songs. There's a learning. Uh, that happens. There is a teaching that happens. Right? Uh, worship also um, prepares. Corporate worship prepares our uh, hearts and provides the atmosphere for preaching of the word. Okay, so well, it's like our hearts are being plowed. It's like the land being plowed to receive the word, you know, the, the seed, to receive the water. Right. So the rain of the Holy Spirit. The word of the word of God, it's like the heart is being prepared, like the land is being plowed. So, um, so it happens. Corporate worship time actually prepares, right? Brings focus. We are we are we step into um, step intentionally, um, draw intentionally closer to the Lord, experience the presence of God, even as we come in agreement with the word of God. And we offer ourselves, offer our worship to God. So the, so many things that happen. There's faith that is being built up. Our spirit is refreshed again. Our minds are renewed to the truth of God's word. And um, and then some of the bondages, you know, some of the bondages, some chains, it just falls off, right? Because in the presence of the presence of God, the mountains melt like wax. So the the anointing of the Holy Spirit breaks the yoke. So all these we experience during worship. Right? So it's not just singing a few songs together, but it is a presence of God which makes a difference, and we are intentionally drawing near to God, and He is promised to draw near to us, and we are becoming more and more aware 
of God's presence, right? So all this happens. Maybe we are singing in the spirit and praying in the spirit, and we are encounter. We are being edified in the spirit, in our in our spirit, and uh, and so many wonderful things happen, right? So corporate worship time, you know, has its place. You know, I know people say, you know, um, you know I, I just want to worship by myself. You know, I don't need to worship together. Uh, I God is there. God's presence is there all the time. I don't need to come together to experience His presence and so on. You know, people say that, but we also know that scripturally there is a place for personal worship, and there definitely is a place for corporate worship, right? Because it, um, Hebrews talks about the fact that we are living stones. We are built up a spiritual house to offer up spiritual sacrifices. And these spiritual sacrifices are the fruit of our lips, which is praise, and the posture of our heart, which is worship. Right. So there is a place for corporate worship. Um, worship also facilitates us to express the feelings of our heart. It could be through the songs. It could be, you know, in uninhibited, in an uninhibited manner. There's so many things that that are in our hearts that we want to vocalize to God, and we've not done it, and it helps us, uh, even, even as others are there to do that along with us, it helps us to open up and open up our hearts, pour out our hearts, and share our hearts to the Lord, right? So so the thing is this, you know, when it comes to uh, encouraging participation in co congregational worship, so we, we understand these are the benefits, these are the outcomes, Right, so so we can go ahead and facilitate and, and encourage people to um, to participate and not just be bystanders or spectators, right? Um, because the way the urban, contemporary, like um, maybe like a non-denominational church, the way the way things are, even in the you know in the denominational churches, like you have. There is, there seems to be a certain divide in the way the you know, physical thing is, right? Like you have the team up there, you have the congregation here. Well, for sake of visibility and for sake of, um, you know, uh, in terms of audiovisual, you no, know, this is how it is. But we know that you know we can change that also, if it, you know, if it is possible. Let's say it's a smaller number, then we can actually put everybody. You know, on the ground, maybe the team, the ministering, you know, uh, people, minister, everyone can be the worship. I mean, the pastor, whoever, and can be around. You know, like a semicircle kind of thing, like we've tried out uh, at times, uh, which is which is fine, right? But but here, since we have this, we need to bring in a sense of it's not us and them, right? It's we are all together. Never bring in that whole thing of you know. We are the team, and you are the, you know, you are not the team, etc. You know, uh, while there is a reality, we are facilitating, but never, it's never us and them. It's it's we all together, and we are pursuing God together. We are worshiping God together, and we need to facilitate that, right? Um, so, how do we develop and create a culture? Right. So, culture, we know, belief. Uh, it is things that we do, and uh, uh, some of the maybe even tradition, right? So, how do we bring in that kind of a culture, right? So, culture, you know, if you want to bring in um, change, if you want to bring in that, establish that kind of a culture, it is a process, right? And it's a process that we go through, which means it starts with revelation. Okay, it starts with the revelation. So awareness and understanding, which we did not have before. Right? So it begins with the revelation of worship. Isaiah 6 talks about what Isaiah, he encountered the Lord. He saw the Lord you know, on the throne and the, and the, the robe is filling the temple. And above it, he saw seraphim and the angel came and... You know, touched his lips with the coal, and he ha he had this wonderful encounter. Right, so it says, you know, woe is me, I'm undone, and um, and then suddenly an awareness of 
God, the holiness of God, and awareness of uh, unworthiness of Him, and and how uh, the cleansing that happened and the purpose that came in. You see, the it all starts with the revelation, right? So, uh, and a revelation of worship is required. A revelation of what uh, what all it involves. So, so teaching. You know, it can be it can be a a small exhortation from the word by whoever's facilitating worship. It can be a sermon series that is done, you know, on why worship, what worship is, etc. So there needs to be a teaching, right, which brings revelation in the hearts and minds of people. So when there is a revelation uh, about worship, then there is we move on to something next, which is the conviction. There's a conviction in our hearts right so what is conviction oh is this something that i'm convinced of it's something that i strongly believe in and that conviction comes out of revelation by the holy spirit you know, I'm, I'm sure that there are several things that you are convinced of because of the revelation that the holy spirit brought you know about who you are in christ jesus and some truths about you know his presence his promise uh, there's a conviction there he will never leave me, never forsake me. He will always be with me. So that conviction comes out of the Spirit of God quickening the Word of God to our spirit, to our heart. Right. So it comes, starts with the revelation, the understanding, the spiritual awareness. Hey, this is God. This is, you know, this is what worship is. And then comes the conviction, the strong uh, belief that this is true. This is scriptural. It's okay to lift hands. It's okay to shout. It's okay to dance. It's okay to, you know, sing. It's okay to use musical instruments. It's, but as long as it's in spirit and truth, right? So there is a conviction in our hearts, and then we move on to action, which means that, well, now I try it out. Now I change. Maybe earlier, I think I thought it was. You know, it was unnecessary to clap hands or unnecessary to lift hands or unnecessary to, you know, it was just a show and all that. But then because of the revelation, I'm convicted in my heart and I can actually take the next step to actually do it. Right? The next time I gather together or maybe when I'm alone and uh, I know that this is true, I know this is okay. And I know that it is done with the right heart posture, then it is fine. So then move to action, right? So, um, so the, it is the conviction that causes uh, us to act on what we believe in, what we are convicted of. So there is action. Then, when there is a you know continued action, then we we move on to a destination. Right, we have continued action. We're saying, okay, I'm convinced now. Next time, I'm going to express worship in these ways. I'm going to go to God, and I'm going to have an encounter with God. I'm going to be expectant of the presence of God. So there is a, you know, there's a continued action that happens every time. Maybe we are we enter into worship on our own, or we enter into worship corporately as a church. You know, there is this continued action, and therefore, there is movement towards a particular, you know, destination. Right, so that's that's when destiny changes. So, what used to be something that you endured, or you thought that okay, this is unnecessary, the singing of songs, now becomes our destiny. That becomes a a, a, a movement. Your uh, your journey towards, you know that, and so that changes the destiny. So, um, we it, it's a it's a life. You know, it's a it's a I won't say you know lifelong journey. Yeah, it's a continuous journey, right? Because there are people who are getting saved. There are people who are coming from different church backgrounds, and then they get plugged into church, and then you know there is a different understanding of worship based on where we are from. And um, some like to be very quiet, and they say this is how I worship. Some like to be really loud and say this is how we worship. But then the Word of God says, okay. This is this is how we worship, right? So this is what is prescribed in Scripture. So there needs to be that teaching uh, on what God says about worship. So that's part of developing the culture, right? Um, well, we pray, we ask the Lord. The more skilled we are, the more revelations we have reached. I mean, we have received, Lord. You know, 
I just want to be humble. I want to stay humble. It's not something that, you know, what can I have that I've not received from you? So how can I think that it's not something that I received from you and think that it's something on my own, right? So, um, and also it, what helps is to, uh, to expose ourselves to different forms of worship. You know, maybe it's liturgical, you know, it has its form. It has its place, prayers that are written down, and they are centuries old, and they are written down, and, and the creeds that are there, you know, creeds are basically statements of faith and belief and rooted in scripture, like the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, and so powerful because they are, you know, they are rooted in the word and in scripture and in the truth, uh, uncompromised truth of who God is and what he wants done. And so, you know, these are things. It could it could be usage of that. It could be usage of, or it could be even more spontaneous expressions of worship. But you know, it's it's good. So you be exposed to it, and you you know use that in um, you know different expressions of worship. For example, you know things like soaking, being quiet, just absorbing, receiving everything that the Spirit of God is pouring out. You know, it just started with the charismatic move and. We find it there, you know, in scripture or in, um, you know, it talks about being still and know that I'm God. Be still and experience. You know, know is to, and it's 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 experience. Experience the truth of who I am. So be still. Let all the world keep silent. Let all the earth keep silent. The Lord is in His temple. Let all the earth keep silent. And several places in the Psalms we say Selah, which is a moment to stop and reflect. Right. So. Things like that in quietness and contemplation and all that is there and right through church tradition and also through the word of God. So, um, so to to you know to expose ourselves and uh, and to build the church, the congregation, in all these different expressions. You know, it's not just loud. being reverential and quiet um, out of reverence but it's also being jubilant and celebratory and everything in between so we need to you know we need to grow personally in all these expressions of worship before we can actually build that as a culture in the church right so you see that it's it's a lot of work it's a continuous work and it's something that we can work towards work towards right okay so I think we'll stop with this. Uh, we've almost reached the end of um, you know the course. Uh, we'll see that what additional things that we can look at uh, when it comes to worship ministry, right? Probably we can watch some I don't know watch some videos and uh, and so on uh, also. But we'll stop here and then we'll continue in our next class, right? Okay, fine. Thank you so much. God bless you.